good morning friends we'll start off i think more people will come in a few minutes uh i was just remembering what manoj said is uh, to thank manoj before his on his last day before he leaves medicine he said whatever we do is to build the kingdom of god so we pray that all these work all these talks will give glory to god so thank you manoj for those words of reminding us why we are doing this uh, i want to thank dr jc len sir has been my teacher i think now for almost 30 years uh, i joined in 87 so taught us biostats at that time now it's 2020 and uh, sir is still teaching us stuff uh, so thank you very much sir so if any time anybody wants to learn something in stats it's one of those who's just dying to teach people and uh, the kind of stats teaching you can get from him you won't get anywhere in the world usually have people from all over the world coming as speakers or they come for workshops and they say that this kind of opportunity you won't get in many of the best western universities also so these are uh, rare people to get in your life to teach you so i wish more people will get uh, you sir when he's here for learning from him all the wealth of knowledge that he has so uh, thank you very much sir very honored uh, why are we having this talk on propensity score as ruth presents a short uh, review of an article you will realize that it's quite common that people are using propensity score uh, you'll also realize that it is very useful thing to do and if you don't have an rct a lot of data and you want to follow up propensity score is becoming a sort of a, a fashion statement but it's also has it's got its pitfalls as well So first, Ruth will present a short uh, article, a recent article on which had used propensity score, so that we'll have an idea of what it's, where it is used. Then Dr. J will teach us all about propensity score, and then we have a time for questions at the end of it to understand when it should be used, when it need not be used. So, uh, with those few words of introduction, I'll ask Ruth to start. For Ruth starts once again. Thank you, Mohan. Let's give Mohan a hand. He's the organizer general of the whole. good morning uh, this is a study which was published in nejm on may 7 2020 observational study of hcq in hospitalized patients with covid 19 uh, hcq su- suggested as effective treatment for corona virus on grounds of anti inflammatory metri and antiviral effect however to date there are no robust clinical trials that show efficacy and data that come from small studies is either uncontrolled or underpowered to detect meaningful clinical effects Uh, this is a observational cohort study the population included were adults who were positive for uh, sars corona virus by either nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab specimen the exposure was uh, receiving hcq at study baseline which is defined as day 1 or 24 hours after getting enrolled into the study and uh, during follow up period before intubation or death the hcq which they gave uh, could have been started at admission within 24 hours after admission beyond 24 hours and some were receiving it even before they were enrolled in the study but it was continued till the patient got intubated or uh, died uh, the control group did not receive hcq they continued to receive the usual care the outcome which they measured was time from study baseline which is day 1 to intubation or death uh, they were enrolled patients from march 7 to april 8 and they followed them up till april 25th at which point the study was stopped so the follow up period is uh, 17 days which is probably good enough for uh, finding how many people get intubated in case of a viral illness inclusion criteria were adults who were positive for uh, sars corona virus from nasopharyngeal oropharyngeal swab at any point during hospitalization hcq was suggested as treatment option for moderate to severe respiratory illness which is uh, resting oxygen saturation less than 94% when patients were breathing at ambient air patients who were already on azithromycin remdesivir and or, uh, sarlizumab were all included in the trial they were not excluded only patients who were excluded were those who got intubated who died or who were transferred to another facility within 24 hours of presentation to the emergency department that is before the baseline so totally uh, 1446 adults were admitted during the covid-19 period out of which 70 people were excluded either because they were intubated or they intubated and died before day 1 or they just uh, died before baseline or they were transferred to another facility so totally 1376 were included in propensity score matched regression analysis 
the baseline manu uh, baseline uh, features for the unmatched patients were uh, most of the patients in uh, HCQ and no HCQ group were in the 60 to 79 years age group. Less than 40 was only 9%. Females accounted for 40 to 45% of the population. There were 50% Hispanics in this study. And BMI seems to be um, um, more in the 25 to 39 uh, range. Uh, most of the patients had insurance in this study, uh, um, most from Medicare. The common uh, past diagnosis of the patients of uh, chronic diseases were diabetes, hypertension and cancer. So if we can see in these two groups, HCQ uh, versus non-HCQ, hypertension was more in the HCQ group, diabetes also was slightly more in the HCQ group and cancer also was slightly more in HCQ group. Also patients who um, had undergone transplant who had HIV or immunosuppressive medications were also more in the HCQ group. Um, further medications at baseline, patients on HCQ group were more number of people who were on systemic glucocorticoids for one of these, one of the um, above reasons. At baseline characters also, the uh, people in the HCQ group were slightly more uh, sicker. Oxygen saturation was lower in the HCQ group. Respiratory rate was also slightly more, average was more. And PF ratios were also lower in the HCQ group. Even the lab values show that uh, they had a baseline higher uh, CRP, higher Procal, higher uh, LDH. So maybe the people in the HCQ group were slightly sicker than the patients in the non-HCQ group. Um, the baseline characters do not appear to be well matched. There were appear maybe slightly sicker patients in HCQ group, which is expected in a cohort study. Therefore, they have uh, for calculating the results, they have adjusted for age, race, uh, insurance, smoking, past diagnosis, current medication, vital statistics, which included the PF ratio, saturation at baseline, and uh, lab tests. Uh, propensity score matching was also done, um, and. Uh, uh, outcomes circumstances were similar uh, propensity score is um, basically uh, they tried to create a imaginary uh, control group and a imaginary exposure group by trying to assign a propensity score for each patient and then matching them based on whatever propensity score they have so initially they tried to find out which patient is probable to be in the hcq group based on the propensity score and which person will probably be in the non hcq group based on the propensity score so they found that certain factors like being uh, a transplant recipient hiv or immunos on immunosuppressive medication meant that you had more chance of being in the HCQ group. Patients on steroids had more odds of being in the HCQ group and lower saturation people uh, were also had more chance of being in the HCQ group. So if all sicker patients go to HCQ group, the final analysis, if we have not matched, may actually show harm in the HCQ group which may not be a correct outcome. Um, further, they have uh, after calculating the propensity score, they have showed us that there is considerable overlap in all the patients who for whom uh, propensity score was done. And if there is considerable overlap, then doing a propensity score actually makes sense, and we'll be able to generate a proper uh, cohort, a new cohort of patients, and then match them and uh, get the results. So uh, what are the results? Uh, finally, they have found that number of events, that is intubation or death, uh, is in crude analysis, it uh, showed that the number of events were 2.37 times more in the HCQ group. It was more in the HCQ group in the crude analysis, which may be false outcome because there were sicker patients in HCQ group and the baseline characteristics were not well matched. However, on multivariable analysis and on propensity score analysis with matching, there was no significant difference between the HCQ group and the no HCQ group, with the hazard ratio being 0 0.98 ranging from 0 0.73 to 1.31. Similarly, when they changed the baseline, that is from 24 hours, when they changed the baseline to 48 hours, maybe to give one more day for HCQ to act, they still found that on multivariate analysis and on matching, there was no difference between the HCQ group and no HCQ group. So HCQ did not add to uh, the probability of them getting intubated, nor was it a protective factor. Uh, 
this is just a table to show the total number of patients in each group and the crude values of them in each uh, arm. So totally 262 patients in the HCQ group got intubated and now HCQ group 84 patients got intubated or died. The baseline numbers are 811 in HCQ group and no HCQ group there are 565 patients. So percentage wise both are same. So the study patients are quite similar to our practice, age group, their comorbidities. Exposure uh, is may be similar because we can also give them HCQ at diagnosis or include patients before. The magnitude of risk was hazard ratio was initially crude hazard ratio was 2.37 showing harm in the HCQ group. However, with matching it was not significant. So there is no significant difference between HCQ and no HCQ arm for primary endpoint which is time to intubation. Um, the one more problem was that uh, in propensity score matching, after matching uh, the N decreased in the no HCQ arm probably because they could not match certain people their propensity scores were way outside so they were all excluded from analysis. Um, good morning. Uh, thanks, Tambu, for this opportunity. I'm very happy to uh, present this small uh, concept-oriented lecture. This is non-technical. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use uh, the sepsis data which came from uh, Tambu and Vignesh. Um, basically, this is a, a statistical method to estimate the treatment effect. Not necessarily you do this for the treatment. Uh, to see the treatment whether it is effective or not. But you could use this for um, any exposure which is related to the outcome. So now, so therefore that when do we use this one? This we use it when there is a non-randomized data available. Say for example, you extract data from EMR or do observational studies. The one she presented is an observational study where you wanted to see whether the, the hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine is better as compared to other arm and so on. Sometimes that we use this as a technique to evaluate a program where the, interva the random allocation is unethical. So this is, but this is the, when you look at the meaning of propensity, there is a tendency to prescribe to one group of people the better intervention as compared to other. Could be uh, based on severity of the illness or they are older and so on and so forth. And when you have a data like this, then how do we claim that one treatment is better than the other? Because that treatment allocation is confounded with a lot of other covariates. So we have that constraint to do. So how are we going to handle this and say that yes, the the, the new to newer treatment is better as compared to standard of care. Please remember this is not randomized. This is going to be confounded with many variables. This is a paper uh, which came out in uh, Lancet May 22nd, similar to this, uh, what she presented. But this has got four arms with one more control arm, which is a standard of care. This is hydroxychloroquine and uh, chloro or chloroquine with, with that macrolide. Uh, interventions. Now this is an observational study dealing with 671 hospitals from six countries. The objective of the study is what happens in the outcome when in each arm, which one is better as compared to the control arm. So you have five arms, the parallel, uh, uh, parallel not parallel arm, this is a cohort study. Now let us look at this, that they have also used propensity score um, matched analysis and they have come out with the conclusion that, that all these four arms are uh, dealing with higher risk as compared to control arm. So therefore the objective of this small presentation is to describe the methods in the propensity score analysis. 
and to discuss whether this is better than simple regression analysis. She also presented simple regression analysis when do we use and is it better than or the PSA is better than that and to diagnose the need for PSA. So, so see when you have a data and there is a dilemma should I use the simple regression analysis or should I use the propensity score analysis? How do we do some preliminary basic analysis and see yes, this demands PSA or not? Now, James, James Heckman uh, from um, Chicago, University of Chicago, he was the one who put this process together. He brought all the mathematics behind. There are papers behind this propensity score analysis and he came out with the method called propensity score analysis in economics. So before he was awarded with Nobel Prize for bringing out this method. And you know the, um, uh, Dr. Abhijit Banerjee, he did not like that kind of adjustment. He went directly into RCTs with many centers. He was awarded with Nobel Prizes, Nobel Prize for having done RCT in economics. We do every day RCT and still we found it difficult to get it published. So this is a scenario in medicine but that is a scenario in economics. Now, so therefore the propensity score is the probability of subject being assigned to a particular treatment. So, so therefore if we have, if we deal with the two treatment, one is newer, another one is standard of care what is the probability that I would get the new treatment given my covariates, my age, the comorbidities and so on. As compared to, uh, not as compared to the other arm, standard of care. So therefore for each patient there is a probability associated with having got that treatment. Please remember this is modeled for getting a treatment, not for the outcome. So therefore what is the probability that I would get a new treatment given my comorbidities, age, severity and so on. That is a probability. This is a score which ranges from 0 to 1. Basically, this is a logistic regression model. This is, you would have seen this. What is the outcome? This outcome here is treatment, yes or no. That uh, new treatment or standard of care and your covariates. So this gives you the probability Therefore, the probability ranges from 0 to 100 percent. So therefore, the suggestion is that when you do this modeling, covariates, as, as, as the, when you compute the propensity score, do not include variables after the treatment decision. So once you have chosen the treatment, don't include any variable which followed after that. And selection of variables regardless of significance. So you can have 20 variables, 30 variables and so on the propensity score analysis. Let us look at the constraints. Now, one of the objective was that why, why can't we do simple regression analysis? That is meant to adjust for confounders. If my comorbidity is more in the new treatment group, that, that this analysis should adjust for it. And um, so why should I go for propensity score analysis? That question needs to be addressed. And usually in the regression analysis, there is a concept called overfitting. When you have less number of subjects in the data set, but you have or less number of outcomes in the data set, you would land up with a very high regression coefficients or very high standard error. That will give you false positive findings. So that is called overfitting. You have small number of observations or small number of events and try to fit the model with many covariates. That is the limitation which we have. So therefore number of variables is larger relative to the number of subjects. So we all talk to you about the rule of thumb. Rule of thumb is that for every covariate there should be 10 bad outcomes, not 10 subjects. Please remember the 10 bad outcomes here, that is where you get the constraints. So, challenge in small scale studies. So, so when you, this is just a simple rule of thumb that my, my data has got that number. If not, then we would ask for PSA. Otherwise, you do simple regression analysis. 
This study she presented dealt with thousands of subjects. I don't know how many covariates they were dealing with, what kind of outcome numbers they had and so on. Looks to me very large number, therefore they can do simple regression analysis. They don't need PSA. Now, the methods of propensity score analysis, there are many methods available that she presented the propensity score matching analysis. And there's another one called the propensity score stratifications and inverse probability uh, weighting and modeling the PSA, the propensity score with the additional covariate along the treatment variable. Let me explain each one little bit and see how do we move, go ahead. This is stratification, simple stratification. You have the range of scores, 0 to 100 percent. Divide the data into first 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60 and so on. So you have five categories if it is a quintile. If it is a decile, then you have 10 categories. When you look at the treatment and no treatment of this score, we presume that this is a homogeneous group to look at. Then each group you see whether the treatment is associated with the outcome or not. So then you consolidate everything by the weighting method that is called uh, stratification analysis. So this is now say for an example this is about there is a study on clot busting treatment versus the standard of care. If you look at that the overall analysis that the age appears to be um, different between the two treatment group who received clot busting that's a blue color and this is the standard of care. So but when you split it into five small categories then each one is a homogeneous category, variability is less. You see not much of a difference in age between these five stratums. Okay? Therefore, the age is well balanced in each stratum. Now, I look at whether the treatment is effective in terms of outcome in each stratum and then consolidate it. So, that takes away that the, uh, you know, that imbalance in the data when you look at the overall. So this, this is simple segmenting your data into small, small groups within each stratum that the outcome is, uh, the, the risk score is homogeneous. Similarly for the sepsis study, if you look at the severity Apache score, there's a big difference between the two groups, who is, who, who, uh, two sepsis and no sepsis. And when you look at the stratum, they are well balanced, except that that the, 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 the last group which had the highest probability, say 80 to 100 percent. So there is a disparity. It looks to me that the severe patients, uh, the sepsis patients were, uh, had a, a very high score of Apache or what. Now, so therefore, there's another matching. This is another method. It's called the matching method. What do you do is that for that the new treatment and the standard treatment, you have two groups and each, each subject in the new treatment, you find the match in the uh, standard of care treatment. Then you just combine them together. So you put a match to that patient. So you explore the match. So you can put the range of matches, plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%, and find the match group to them and uh, as if you have a matched case control study data analysis, now you have the two data is matched, you do the analysis. So therefore the following methods, the various methods of matching is, you know, the Magalhães is the one, the Indian who found out the uh, distance statistics, who established uh, Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta, that his method is popularly used. and. So this is after using this matching process, combining the, care, the new treatment with the, the standard of care treatment and then do the conventional regression analysis or matched pair analysis. So that will address, that will take away that confounding effect in the group. This is very commonly used. She also uh, shown us a similar graph where if you see before matching the data, if you look at this, the score is very high. This is the clot group. See here, so those who had, those who were severe, um, uh, those who were severely deceased or whatever, they're, uh, they're more likely to have that clot busting treatment.
as compared to the standard of care treatment. There is a severe imbalance in terms of the score. This is before matching, you have 400 cases. After matching, if you look at here, the lower score that this group is more, that th those who received standard of care, this group is more, after matching they have come down. But the, it has not made any big change in the higher side of the score because it failed. It is not able to match. So therefore my reading is that matching would not have worked in this data very well, okay, except a small change here. And she said in the matching process we have lost 16 cases here. That is why there is a small imbalance here. The sepsis study, you have sepsis and no sepsis. It's not related to treatment, outcome is mortality. Okay. So now this is, here you see the same thing has happened. So the matching worked very well on the lower side of the score that no treat, no sepsis group uh, matched with the sepsis group. You see here, there is a good matching here, but it has not changed anything here. So it raises a question whether matching really worked for the higher side of the score and rather than the, uh, the lower side of the score. The another method is called the inverse probability weighting method, very popularly known or used. So this has got a very strong mathematical background. That is how James Heckman has done a lot of uh, review on statistics and brought this method uh, to the science. Now this is say for example, we all know that this is um, the inverse probability weighting applies weights corresponding to this for patients in the treated cohort, meaning that newer treatment. So if I get a re newer treatment, we all know that the probability of selecting a newer treatment constrained with the covariate, given covariates, therefore that probability has to be much higher because if I am older, very sick, you put me on a better treatment uh, than the other person who is younger and not very severe. So therefore my score is likely to be very high. So if that happens, that the whole the distribution of the propensity score is highly skewed for the new treatment group. That is known. So therefore what they are saying this, so the, because the selection process, the tendency to allocate the treatment based on the covariates, more likely to be very high in the new treatment group. So therefore what they do is, take the inverse of that value. So when you take inverse, it becomes lower. You do the same thing for the control group. So if this, is become, this becomes higher. So they will reverse the whole process. What happens is when your probability is around 40 to 60 percent, it doesn't make any change. So only the lower end and the higher end get inversed. So artificially, what it creates is a comparative population it creates. So that is why it is a very popularly used method. And um, so therefore, due to large weights, the propensity score close to zero for treatment group and close to one for control group. It reverses the whole scenario and the middle range of probability doesn't make much difference. Okay. Now, this is a modeling I like personally because uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, we, we like modeling. If you look at this one, that which treatment had better mortality, lower mortality, that is our question, after adjusting for the covariates. Now, see here, this is the score. The score was derived from 30 plus variables in the sepsis study. Okay, the class busting study score was derived from 20 plus variables. So 20 plus variables were made as one single score, like a composite score. Now you tell me, will I have any power problem? Should I worry very much about number of deaths, number of subjects in my data? I don't have to, because I am dealing with only two variables here. So maximum I should have 20 events in my data, 20 uh, deaths in my data plus one constant term, 30 dates in my data, okay? If I put 30 variables here, then I need to have 300 dates in my data. So therefore, what it does is that it extracts 
the synthesizes the 30 variables information as a probability score and put it in this. So now I can claim I have adjusted for that the covariate problem and now I am addressing whether the newer treatment is better and reduces the mortality or not. Okay. Now there is something called um, doubly robust analysis in the sense Sometimes, besides this, people put the covariates also in the model. So, so the doubly robust methods. So, so, we don't do that because this is commonly used methods. So, therefore, we see here, I explained to you the four commonly used methods. Very commonly used is the stratification method. So, I am also going to show you that the paper which I showed you used a matching method. Now, on what situation? The question is, if I have big data, so like if I have thousands of cases, should I go for PSA analysis or should I use simple regression analysis? Will that do? That is the question. This is, this is a good paper on um, um, this is cardiovascular study, um, uh, diseases. You know, this is Stuart Pocock is a very famous uh, statistician from London School. He wrote the first or second book on clinical trials. Uh, there is a copy available in God Library. And um, on his name, that there is a stopping rule in a sequential trial that is called Pocock method. He was the one who re realized the problem in multiple comparisons and he brought out the adjustment to the science. Such a big person that this is from London School. So they have analyzed this study, CHARM study, you would have uh, seen this, which deals with nearly 7,500 subjects. Okay. How many covariates? 18 covariates, 18 variables, the so beta blockers. This is a distribution of the score. Now, there is a good overlap between who received control and who received that beta blockers. Now we look at this, the, uh, the score distribution, propensity score distribution. Do you see a big difference between the two arms? It's a very good overlapping between the two arms. So now you look at the analysis here. This is the crude analysis. <coughs> crude analysis is that it tells you only 35% protection due to beta blocker in terms of mortality. So. So, can I accept this result? Okay, this is the question. Can I accept this result? 35% mortality. They went ahead with the covariate adjustment means regression analysis. Covariate adjustment, you just adjust it. Simple regression analysis, multivariate regression analysis with the 17 var 18 variables and it has brought down the efficacy to nearly 25%, not 35%. Do you understand this graph? Now, they have used various um, uh, the, uh, PSA analysis and they are all around 25 to 28%. So, the crude analysis suggested 35% efficacy, but other analysis have suggested about 25% efficacy. So, which result to be trusted? That we would say this. You have a second question to be addressed. Now, if you look at the regression analysis, and the PSA analysis, they are all similar. So why should I complicate myself with the PSA analysis? Should I do only regression analysis? That is enough. So that is a question to be answered. So they were promoting that. You don't have to do mechanically the PSA. Just look for regression analysis. Now this, you see this platelet reactivity therapy. So not much of a difference. This is a good overlap. And see here, this is the crude rate and these are all the uh, other adjusted analysis rates and they are close to each other. So your regression analysis or PSE analysis does not contribute much to the science. Okay. But you look at this one, and this is the thin study, that you see the crude is somewhere here. This is, the crude suggested 45% efficacy. Okay. And you see here the overlapping is very minimal, so not very, so minimal. But you see 
that patients who received statins had a higher probability score. So therefore, there is a selection process in giving statins. So therefore, that made a big difference. That showed you 45% efficacy. But when you do the regression analysis, this is this much. So only 15%. So the results have gone from 45% to 15% and see all these analyses are nearly same. This also suggests the fact that that PSA is no different from your regression analysis. So now therefore when do I use regression analysis? Here also there is a less overlap and see here the crude is here and the, all the adjusted analysis are here. Okay, and the regression analysis and the PSA analysis are nearly similar. So all these four studies dealing with thousands of subjects suggested that you don't need PSA analysis, you need only regression analysis. Okay, and also there is a, when there is a less overlap, there is a big change in the efficacy results. Please remember this. Is. So I am using the word overlap. Most of the other papers have used a statistics called overlapping statistics. We will discuss about it. Okay. So this is, we were able to get hold of this data from the following site. So we did some exploratory work. This is a mortality in the clause busting arm is nearly 16% and this is 19%. Only 3% difference. And you see here that the, this who received clot busting treatment the age was much higher as compared to this group otherwise the risk severity and uh, severity index and the risk score are nearly similar not much of a difference so only the age is big, uh, bit different therefore there is a need to just for it and now you tell me that what kind of overlap going on between the two uh, you know, clot busting and the standard of care arm. Is it a very high overlap, small overlap, moderate overlap? That would suggest us what to do. So therefore, this is, now if you look at this crude analysis, that it is protective by, uh, let's say, 30% uh, or whatever, uh, I think 30%, and it is not statistically significant. But when you do this covariate adjustment, it looks like there is a good improvement and the PSA analysis also showing similar results. This shows that absolutely no effect. So therefore, it I am not sure that this the previous graph had shown you any idea whether I need to do a PSA analysis, stop with a simple uh, analysis. If you go back to the number, this is, so 70, so you have 70 deaths, at the maximum you can have 7 variables to look for. So it tells me that I, it depends on how many variables we have, they are dealing with the 3 variables. Regression analysis itself is enough because you have good number of events in your study. Now, so the overlapping is really big, therefore it does not need any uh, PSA analysis. If you look at this one, that they are all nearly similar, it did not make much difference. Okay. And this is about the sepsis study, as I said, it is not used only for treatment evaluation, but you can use this for exposure and the mortality. Okay, and thus we are dealing with the 1000 plus subjects and the mortality rate in the sepsis arm is 40% and the control no sepsis group is 20%. So these are all the variables which we have studied. Nearly we studied 30 plus variables and um, this is the overlapping um, a diagram which tells there is a good amount of overlap. The, to my knowledge that it suggests that I don't have to do PSA. Regression itself is okay because you have you are dealing with the 30 variables. Your number of outcome events are 300. So you, you are okay with your number and the outcome events. Therefore, my common sense says that you don't need PSA analysis. Okay. This is the overlapping. So, when you look at the crude data, the mortality is much higher in overall in the sepsis arm. But when you do the PSA, you see here, except that matching data, all these things are nearly same. So, it said that the mortality is not that high in the sepsis arm as compared to other arm. 
If you don't do this analysis, you would say sepsis people are dying more. So therefore, in a way, that PSA analysis or regression analysis really help you to get the right information uh, from this data. So other viewpoints. So I presented the POCOG paper about what they felt about the four cardiovascular diseases. Which the conclusion he said, the propensity score methods are not necessarily superior to conventional covariate adjustment. That is your regression analysis. And care should be taken to select the most suitable method. Okay. So what you do is, <coughs> we do some, you know, fishing that I do every method and see wherever there is a big difference, I'll just publish it and say I have used that method. So what he's saying, it should be a priori and so on and so forth. Uh, soon after this paper, there was a letter to editor from this group and they have used a very strong um, term, last nail in the coffin. So they said that Pokag is such a big person, he concluded something, they said this is a lost nail. So, so they said that, so this is, this may not be correct, the conclusion not necessarily novel. And most importantly, we identified three major issues in the paper. One is lack of, lack of gold standard. So that means that to verify he doesn't have the third uh, the gold standard to see which method is better. And uh, focus on large studies. This is, they are dealing with 5,000 to 8,000 subjects. Missed opportunity for explore disease risk scores. So therefore, they are, I, am, I understood that they are not dealing with the disease severity score uh, and so on. This is a, a strong letter to editor. Then let's see how he commented to this letter. So there are other papers, propensity score methods give similar results to traditional regression modeling in observational studies, a systematic review. So therefore, that need not necessarily when I have an observational study, I should do always PSA. I can deal with regression method. Okay. So now that uh, I went through that um, uh, Malavika did a lot of uh, review and um, there is something called overlapping coefficient. So, so long we have, I've been asking you whether there's a good overlap, less overlap and so on. There's no statistics behind what does that kind of overlap. Okay. So, See, for example, this is, uh, we derived, we simulated data using beta distribution and um, this overlap is 35%. It gives you the value for overlap. So you can compute for such a study and any study you can find out the overlap. What was, uh, what is wonder, wondering, what I was wondering about, why these people did not use AUC? AUC is very commonly used in medicine. <coughs> when you deal with the two treatment arm, there is a score. I can do the, the ROC for the two treatment arm and see what is the kind of area that I get. Say for example, this is a less overlap and the AUC is around 90%. The AUC tells me that it is worth doing a PSA analysis if the AUC is better, that the less go with very high AUC. And similarly, this is about 70% overlap. You see 70% AUC. It's not EQ vocal bead. I don't know whether I would do that PSA or not. But definitely, this is a high overlap that if you see your, the AUC, it is about 50%. This tells you that you don't need any PSA analysis at all. So now, is that that easy that I would say? that we, so sepsis study, we did that one. Sepsis study dealt with overlapping coefficient of 60, 60% uh, 60%, about 60% and the AUC is 80%. So this is clot bus study is 80% and this thing. So this definitely tells us it doesn't need the PSA analysis, but this study maybe suggests that nearly 80% AUC, you might need PSA, okay? So doing this kind of preliminary analysis that will guide you to see whether you need a PSA analysis or not. If you look at the corresponding the picture of the PSA, the area under the curve, ROC curve, that you see this is sepsis data and um, this is a good ROC, this is not that good ROC. 
So anything about AUC of 60%, I would not go for AUC, that uh, PSA, and if it is above 70%, I would go for ASA. But we need to document it clearly using various simulations. So this is what I said. When you look at the AUC here, this is 70% or 80%, about 80%. And um, this is, say, the crude and uh, other PSA analysis. I just duplicated the slide to tell you that the PSA analysis made a big difference as compared to this analysis. However, the regression is not different from <coughs> PSA analysis here. So because they are dealing with a large number of observations, 1,000 subjects, 300 deaths, 30 variables, it doesn't need PSA, you need simple regression analysis, that would do. So therefore, coming back to Pocock's uh, response to the recommendation that he said delivering the last nail in the coffin for propensity score absolutely not our intent and we agree that propensity score methodology could have benefits in selected situations. So however we have at least challenged their fashionable and indiscriminate use. So therefore the IRB has a habit of suggesting that for any cohort study you do one PSA. Well, should, they should not be or we should not be doing it. And I know, I don't know, you might ask, what is the harm in doing it? That kind of question should be addressed. And suggesting that when you say, no harm in doing it, am I torturing the data? Am I torturing the statistician and asking him to do the PSA? This is another question. So we'll see. However, he said that suggesting the old fashioned covariate adjustment will often do a perfectly good job and may even be preferred in many scenarios. So that is what is, you know, is a very big person. And so to conclude, useful when event per variable is less than 10. When you have a small scale study where less number of outcome events, but you have many variables to be studied. So the propensity score synthesize this many variables into one variable, and then you do the regression analysis of PSA, and that level it will be very useful. <coughs> so therefore, you do simple that uh, that ROC analysis and things like that will help you to decide whether you wanted to go for a PSA analysis or not. So I'll stop here. If you have any questions, we'll discuss it. There, are there any questions? Uh, slightly. Yes, sir. sir. Thank you, Jaisilan. Um, made a very difficult concept, very easy to understand. Uh, I have a question about that paper you quoted, oh. Lancet paper. Yes. That had about 96,000 subjects in the five arms altogether. The total sample size was about 96,000 or so. Huge number. Yeah. So they did a propensity score matching. So your suggestion is that uh, they could have easily done uh, and their outcomes were also in the thousands if I remember oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So did they really need to do a propensity score matching? They don't need but uh, they say also said that they have done because they should not, or I don't know whether they have been asked to do or something but I read the, uh, I circulated the paper that uh, they have uh, done uh, propensity score matching analysis. In spite of that, till, uh, still that death rate was uh, very high. Uh, so uh, that is uh, something. So it looks to me that <coughs> they have done mechanically. I will not do that. So if you know that if you have guide or by looking at the common sense of the review which we had done, that you would say I need it or I don't need it. That kind of conclusion. So. Second question, after you have done a pro calculated a propensity score and then matched, yeah. uh, when you do the analysis, mm -hmm. do you need to do a regression analysis? Because now it's only treatment, no treatment, exposure, no exposure and the covariate, yes. the, the propensity score. Yeah. So do we need a regression analysis again after that? No, we, uh, that is uh, with the outcome you have to do the with regression. The outcome. Ah, ah. Yeah. With the outcome, ah. treatment ah. plus PS. PS, that's oh, all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That is, a, I like that modeling and that looks to me uh, that matching it and things like that when you have large scale data it's cumbersome. But the current version of SPSS I, I read that it has that provision, Stata has provision so it should be easier to use that kind of analysis. 
um, just because of that um, um, the the stratification and the matching and uh, IPW these are all available now so it should be easier to do that I personally like the modeling work get the PS score then you have the treatment or no treatment two variables now correlate with the outcome that will tell you the new treatment is better or not again the problem of uh, you can uh, only include in the score calculation what you consider as potential confounders, the covariates. Uh -huh. So the problem about unknown confounders still remains. Uh, yes. So it does not uh, mimic that randomization. So it deals only with the variables which you have observed and is trying to balance it. So, so it still it does not, even because you have done PSA doesn't mean that it is equal to randomization. The randomization, as was he said, that unknown factors are balanced by philosophy that that doesn't happen here in a smaller study with smaller event rates will this be superior to a logistic regression definitely, definitely it, will it will be superior to any uh, logistic regression you will end up with the very um, biased coefficients if you do logistic regression. Anything to buffer that, sir? No. Anything to Anything do? else we can do to buffer that magnification of the outcomes um, that this will show in a smaller study? Uh, the regression analysis which has a, which assumes a linear relationship between your effect and the outcome, is that solved by propensity matching? Yes, the assumptions are same. Say, for example, if I have an outcome um, change in BMI, for example, which is a continuous variable, then you have a PSA score, which is derived based on logistic regression model, and treatment and no treatment. Now, I would do linear regression analysis. If the outcome is alive or dead, then I would do logistic regression analysis. If the outcome is time to death, time to event, I would do Cox proportional assignment. When I say regression, it depends on what is your outcome area. But uh, whatever the model of regression we are using, we are still assuming that there is a linear relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Is that solved by propensity matching? Because in health, we realize that all the assumptions are not really true with regression, that it, there is not always a linear relationship. But when I say, I say for an example, logistic, logistic, logit is a transformation which makes the probability as linear. So the, the question doesn't arise at all. We do some other status diagnosis to see if the model fits the data. That holds good. So when you do regression analysis of the BMI example which I said, which is a continuous variable, that is where you look at this, whether it follows a linear pattern or not. If not, then you do transformation and make it linear. Okay. So you don't talk about linearity assumption when you do a proportional hazard model. So you do it in a way that you do some other diagnosis see, to see what it happening. Regression means, you, I think your mind gets stuck with only the linear regression, linear, linear. So when you have a logistic, that is also a regression. Proportional hazard model, that is also a regression. So therefore, you don't claim linearity in these two models as compared to linear regression. So. Uh, shall we give Dr. J.C. in a big hand? Actually, uh, the idea for the talk, sir, has been saying for some time, many people are just using propensity score for indiscriminately in all papers. And now with the COVID, we have been seeing increased huge number of publications using propensity. So it's a very apt time for us, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you to also the team of youngsters who helped, sir, to do all this. We are very grateful for them as well. Thank you.